Right, so this is a chapter 13 ANOVA testing uh, first video. And if you saw the notes back up, it looks kind of long, but there's a lot of writing in there. But you may have noticed that somewhere in the middle, I put a picture, uh, a page that looks like this, where I put all my writing on it. And then I also gave you a blank copy of the same paper because there's so much writing, like there's so many formulas in this. And um, I just thought it might be easier to follow along if you already kind of had the big picture there. Um, it's just this one time after this, or maybe there's another, uh, I'll tell you in the next video, I can't remember. Um, but there are some shortcuts calculators um, that we will talk about to help us with some of these formulas. It, we can't shortcut straight to the end, but we can um, help along the way. All right, so if you have not already, read this first page right here. Um, I'm going to talk about it, but of course I'm not going to read it to you because you all know how to read. Um, so we're going to go over that and um, it is a lot of pages, but some of them only have like one or two things on it. So we'll see how long it takes. Okay, so here we go with ANOVA testing. So again, we are testing and we are coming um, up with a hypothesis, all that fun stuff. It's, it's different variation. This is chapter 11 was another variation. So this is called ANOVA testing. And the ANOVA comes from analysis of variance. So we're going to be talking about the variance going on in these problems. Um, so it says right here, for example, does the average gas mileage of a car depend on the type of car model? So we are talking about the factor which in the previous problems we called, we've always called it independent, but we called it the X variable. We've called it the um, explanatory variable and the factor. It's just another word for that independent variable. And then the response or dependent is the Y. So we have these two, um, two variables, but we are testing the uh, effect of one factor. Does gas mileage cars depend on the type of car model. Okay, so here's some examples where you might do ANOVA testing. A researcher wants to determine if the mean time for pain relief medication to take effect are the same for the three medications. So we are comparing three means. Previously, like in hypothesis testing, we would just be comparing one mean. Um, and we want to know if they are pretty much the same or if at least one is different. Um, here we, number two, we have a local university and they want to know if the mean age is the same for, and they have these freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, which means four means are being compared. Um, and we want to see if um, these are the same or if at least one mean is different. So there's six steps that we're going to use, and you will see these six steps in the Newton Alpha homework. So make sure you have these six steps handy as you're going through it. But the six steps um, to confirm um, that the conditions are met. And then um, actually, these six steps are just the steps of how to do it. I was thinking of the conditions. The conditions will be um, listed in the unit home, of the homework. So we'll do that in the next part and then you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. So make sure the conditions are met, set up the null and alternative hypothesis which is just like we've done in chapter nine and in chapter 11. Then we are going to determine the degrees of freedom, which will help us determine the critical value and the re rejection region, similar to what we've done before, test statistics. So we have critical value, we have test statistics. And then um, a little different here, we'll be constructing an ANOVA table. So this is the meat of this section. This is what's gonna be the most time consuming. And then we will make a decision for the hypothesis test to um, interpret the results. So the step five is really the big one, the different one in this problem, or in this um, chapter. Okay, so we want to confirm the conditions. We're going to practice um, step one. So we're not really going to do a whole problem um, all the way through. 
we're just going to practice these various steps in this first video and then we will do a full problem uh, in the next video but we will cover all the steps at various okay so here i'm going to kind of slowly here because i want to keep these uh, bottom five conditions available but for this one we want to see if this the conditions are met and then we want to state the known alternative hypothesis so it says the statistician wants to set up a hypothesis test to determine if the mean yearly tuition for colleges and universities is different in Massachusetts versus California versus New York. So we have the three, um, we're talking about mean here, we have our three means, and this is assumed the population are normally distributed, all samples are randomly selected, and it was determined that the variance for the yearly tuition was higher in Massachusetts compared to the other states. So let's look at the conditions first. I'm going to write the null and alternative regardless of what happens um, with the conditions, just to practice it. However, oh, okay, good. Huh. However, um, if the conditions weren't met, you would normally just stop the problem. All right, step one, each population um, from which a sample is taken is assumed to be normal. Because this is the answer to number one. Check. That's done. All samples are randomly selected and independent. That is step two, randomly selected. The populations are assumed to have equal standard deviations or variances. Well, it turns out that the variation, the variance uh, was higher in Massachusetts. Higher in Massachusetts means no. So in this example, the variances aren't equal. So this failed. Um, let's just talk about the last two, just uh, because. So here, the factor is a categorical variable. Yes, we're talking about the states. So that's a category. And the response is a numerical variable. Yes, we're talking about the mean tuition. Remember these words from before. Well, you know what numerical means. Categorical means a word and some sort of category. So it actually meets four out of the five. But since it failed on step number three because the variances are equal, then um, Oh, we shouldn't normally do it. The hypothesis. We aren't, we're not going to do a test for it, but we will at least write down the normal alternative hypothesis. All right. So, for all of these, just like we've talked about before, the null hypothesis is that they are all equal. So, what we're talking about here is the mean in Massachusetts is equal to the mean in New York is equal to the mean in California. All the means are equal. And so then uh, something that would negate that would be at least one is different. At least one mean. At least one mean is different. All right, so we have um, all equal, or at least one is different. Now remember, I've said this before, but it's even more so now. Um, in the past, we said you can't, the opposite of they're all equal is not none of them are equal. The opposite of they're all equal, or the alternative to that would be at least one of them is different. So we're not saying that necessarily every single one of them is different from each other. We're just saying um, at least one of them is different. So that will be our alternative. All right, step two, degrees of freedom. Now we have talked about degrees of freedom before in a couple different uh, parts, back in chapter eight, and then again, I don't know, it was a while ago, and then again in chapter 11. So here we are, ooh, here we have the degrees of freedom. Okay, so again, 
take your time, read through this, highlight what you need. I put a lot of facts in here, like, oh, it's me, Dr. Sir Ronald, or English study. So there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, but, and I will come back to this because a lot of this won't mean anything right now, but this in bold right here is important. What we're looking for, the test statistic that we're looking for, is going to be the ratio of the variability between the groups to the variability within the groups. Again, right now it's a little new and overwhelming, so we can come back to explain that later. Um, however, that's the key to this chapter. Okay, so what we need to do is, well, what we're going to do is we're going to have, since we have a ratio right here, talking about a ratio, that means we're going to have a fraction. And fractions have numerators and denominators. The reason I'm bringing that up is because for one-way ANOVA test, we are going to have a degrees of freedom for the numerator, and we're going to have a degrees of freedom for the denominator. So when you see it written out, the notation will be F, and then the degrees of freedom for the numerator, comma, the degrees of freedom for the denominator. Just like over here, the degrees of freedom for the numerator is four, so we see that right here. The degrees of freedom for the denominator is 10, so we see that right here in a second. All right, so this is how we find the degrees of freedom. There are two rules because there are two parts of this fraction. The degrees of freedom for the numerator is k minus 1. The degrees of freedom for the denominator is n minus k. And you know what n and k are, they're the same thing they've always been. n is the number of, uh, well, it tells you that they're two. n is the number of things we're talking about. Same, and it sounds a little confusing here, the sum of the sample is the same thing. It's the number of things we're talking about. And k is the number of groups. Last time we called it, it looks like a c, but it's a parenthesis. Number of categories. So on this problem right here, we're just focusing on the degrees of freedom. So K, one, two, three, four. K equals four because there's four categories. And how many things are we talking about all together? Not how many categories, but in this case, how many employees are we talking about all together? So we're going to add all those numbers up, and we have that n equals um, 60. All right, so the degrees of freedom for the numerator is going to equal k minus 1. 4 minus 1 is 3. And the degrees of freedom for the denominator is going to equal n minus k. That is 60 minus 4, which is 56. So that's not so bad. Yes, it's some, a, a new formula with that n minus k in there. But degrees of freedom isn't so bad to calculate. So let's look at step 3. We're going to focus on how to use those degrees of freedom to get a, um, a critical value from our table. So, read through example three. And what I want you to do is read, oh, where am I? read through example three and then find the degrees of freedom for the numerator and the denominator. And then we will come back and we will talk about how we use that to find, uh, oh, wrong page, where's my pause page? There we go, we'll talk about how to use that to, um, to how we're gonna apply that to the table, which is on the back of this. All right, so go ahead and pause your video and find those two degrees of freedom. All right, so if you are paying attention, you'll notice my background changed because when you paused the video, I paused it too, and I moved away from my noisy children. All right, so here we are coming back and you should have your degrees of freedom already calculated for this problem. And so what we did here, oops, I don't have to wait, there we go. We have the degrees of freedom for the numerator 
which is k minus 1, and the degrees of freedom for the denominator, which is n minus k. And in this problem, we have k is 3, because there are three categories, or three medications. And then, and this is where you need to double check, n is 15, because five uh, people are selected to take each of the medications. So it says for each medication, five people are selected. So if you didn't catch that for each at the beginning, um, you would miss that this is actually a sample size of 15 for the whole group, the total number of things we're talking about. All right, so once you get those two down straight, we have uh, k minus 1 is 2, and then n minus k is 12. A common error, I don't know why this happens, but I see it every semester. Did people do k minus 1? They get the right answer every time. And then for n minus k, they use that answer from above, and they get the wrong answer. So make sure when you do the n minus k, you're using the k and not um, the degrees of freedom from the numerator. Okay, so we have those two numbers. Alpha is 0 0.05 because that was given in the problem. And alpha is always going to be 0 0.05 in these problems. And I want to explain why that is. So on this last page that you have, and I'll, if you can't read this, don't worry, I'm going to put it on the screen in a minute. Um, but this last page is the table that we're going to use. And you know, I'll just put it on right now. So we have, um, oh, where's it? Just the last page. Let me scroll down to the last page. Okay, so what we have here, as soon as it kind of catches up and refocuses, is we have a table and it says in one column, the degrees of freedom for the denominator, and the other column, the degrees of freedom for the numerator. And this table is for L equals 0 0.05. I, I already have two columns. I have the, the denominator and I have the numerator columns. I don't have enough room to have another column um, or, or not column, dimension. I already have the two dimensions, the numerator across and the denominator down. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't have any more room to have a third dimension because then I would end up with a cube instead of a piece of paper. And so what's really going on here is this packet, oops, I'm trying to show myself because I'm talking a lot. Um, this, this table is actually a packet of tables and they would have an alpha of 0 0.01 would have its own page, and 0 0.05 has its own page, and 0.10 has its own page, and, and so on and so forth. And this can be quite long. In fact, um, this is just truncated at six degrees of freedom for the numerator and 15 degrees of freedom for the denominators. So this could go on forever. And so to keep it simple, I am just focusing in this class, um, in this chapter, on alpha equals 0 0.05. On the homework, You've seen it before in other sections. You don't actually need your own table. They insert the table right there for you. So alpha is not as important in this chapter because I'm trying to simplify it by having just one table and I'm just using the table for alpha equals 0 0.05. All right, so now that we are at our table, we had for this last problem, I wrote it down. Let's see, the degrees of freedom for the numerator. So across the top is the numerator. I don't, I don't need to be here anymore. Um, and the degrees of freedom for the denominator is 12. So where do they meet? Right here at 3.89. So that is how we find the critical value. Table, not so hard. In fact, the table's always been the easy part of these problems. It's the, the critical value for the table. That's the one we like. It's the test statistic that takes a bunch of time. All right, so critical value. And it's from the table value was uh, 3.89. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing. We're going to draw a normal distribution. We are going to have our critical value be the cutoff for the reject region and the fail to reject region. And then we will place our test statistic on that. The time consuming part is the test statistic. Okay, so here is how we compute the test statistic. I said earlier that the test statistic is a ratio 
of two numbers. It's a fraction. And so here we see what that fraction looks like. This is the final step. Once we find the MS, um, the mean square, MS means mean square, the mean square between the two groups and the mean square within the two groups, then we will be at our statistic. But that mean and within is really the key to this uh, whole problem. And we'll get into that into much more detail, but here we have, if the test statistic is greater than the critical value, we reject, less than, fail to reject. In other words, this is just like chapter 11, a right-tailed test. So, brief overview, compute the test statistic using that. Okay, so how do we compute the st test statistic? Well, we will need to use a ANOVA table. So I don't really know why step four is to compute the test statistic and step five is to do the table, but who cares? That's what it is. So here we have, look at this right here. This is the test statistic. This is the last step. Test statistic. That's the last step of this table. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be focusing on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to get the eighth box. Now, I'm just gonna tell you straight up the easy part and the hard part. Okay, let's see here. here let's see, I'll tell you. Um, you already know how to do the degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna count that as easy because we've already done it. This MS column, it's just literally gonna be division of numbers we already know. SS between, right here. Degrees of freedom between, right here. Boom. So this will be easy once we get there. That'll be very easy to do. MS within, same thing. Within, within, just divide them. That'll be very easy to do. This SS within, we're just going to subtract two numbers that we already know. Subtraction is easy. Boom. Oh, and you know what? This F test statistic, that is also just division. So look at that. We have six easy problems. And by easy, I mean we are either subtracting or dividing two numbers. Calculators, perfect, that'll be very easy. You could probably guess that the other two were hard because I mean, just look at them, eek. There's a lot of symbols going on. So those two are gonna be hard. We are gonna take our time and go through it very carefully at first just to make sure you understand what's going on. And this is why I included a copy of my already filled out notes um, but what's happening here is we need to figure out what's going on between the two and then um, also what's going on within the two in order to find the test statistic for um, this ANOVA table. Okay, so we're going to do this right now. Now, let's just look ahead real quick. Um, here's the problem. This is what we're going to do. Blank page. You can write all over this. Obviously, it's your notes. You can do whatever you want. Same problem but I already wrote on it. So this may be one that you wanna just kind of have handy. And um, this is the one I'm gonna talk about, but no, don't have this up. We'll talk about this and then have this one handy so you can write all over it your extra notes. I don't know, do whatever you want. I'm not there, I can't see you, but that's what's going on at these two pages. And then finally, this problem goes on forever. Um, you wanna have this blank table available also because we're gonna fill it in with the numbers that we are calculating. Okay, so let's look at this problem. We have a researcher comparing the amount of sodium in milligrams for three different fast food restaurants. You can tell from the chart, we have three restaurants. So K is three. Okay, so far so good. All right, then we wanna know what N is. Now I'm not adding up these numbers to find out what N is. What I'm doing is I'm counting the numbers to find out what N is because each category or each number listed in this chart is the average amount of sodium that is being used in the, in whatever, this various sandwiches that we're making at these restaurants. So this is not 930 people. This is not 930. Um, I don't know. I was trying to make a uh, not sleep this. Oh my gosh, I don't even know what I'm referencing. You've got mail. Trying to make a, a 90s romantic movie. You've got mail reference. Um, 
totally spaced on that. Okay. Yeah. If I knew how to uh, edit this video, I'd go back and delete that, but what are you going to do? Okay. So 930 is how much sodium one, how many, so basically N is asking how many sandwiches are in our survey? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, huh. Why did I write 15? The world will never know. Okay, that's a 13. Good thing you are here with me as I am fixing these mistakes. Now I'm looking ahead. I did use the correct number 13 for all the other times N is listed. I'm glad we counted that out. Um, but N is 13 because there are 13 numbers. I was probably being lazy and said, oh, five rows, three columns, but obviously there's some empty spots there. Okay, so here we go. Now, now that we know N and um, K, I just picked those to start with because those are the two easy ones. What we want to do is we want to add up um, all the numbers in the row. So take these four numbers in the column, I mean, take those four numbers, add them up. Take those five numbers, add them up. Take these four numbers, add them up. What do you get? Oh, wait, I don't have anything going on. I'll take a drink of water. You go ahead and add those. Pause the video if I go too fast. All right, so when you add all those up, this first one, you should have 300, I'm sorry, 3,315, 3,410, 3,155. That's what's happening up here. That's what this symbol means, add them up. You should know that by now. The sigma means add up all the X's in this row or column. Add up all the X's in this column. Add up all the X's in that column. That's what those, those, that notation at the top means. Okay, so we added up the whole column. And now we have done all the calculations we can do from this chart. And we are going to jump into um, the formulas listed in this table here. Okay, we're gonna start off with the total just because there's less happening. There's only these two little things. And um, yeah, we're gonna add them up. Um, we're, we're actually gonna use our calculator, so this is gonna be very helpful. But what you wanna do, or so yeah, we're gonna do this, and I wrote the notation on the notes, and then we're gonna do the between. So this will be first, and then this will be second, and then we'll fill in all the rest. Okay, so here we go. The SS total is the sum of the x squared. Now, I can't add up all the numbers like I just did. This, we're actually gonna um, pause. This is not pause the video, but we're actually going to use later these numbers right here. We're gonna use that later. So just put that, put that on the back burner. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna find the sum of the x squared. So there's a difference between this symbol and this symbol. And the difference is the order of operations, those parentheses there. This first one is saying add up x squared. So you'll notice here I took each number, 930, which is from the first uh, spot, 750, 765, and so forth. I took all those numbers and I squared them, and then I added them. And that is important because the order of operations says we would square first, exponents first, and then add. The second part, the sum of the x squared, we'll, we'll get to the end in a minute, um, but the sum of the x squared, that means add up everything, because it's in parentheses, and then square it. So you'll notice I added up all the numbers, and then I squared it. Okay, clearly, this is tedious, right? Like, look at all those numbers that I wrote out. 930 squared, 750 squared, and then I wrote them all again, and I squared it. A lot to type into your calculator. So what I want to do now, before we continue, stopping it right here. Okay, perfect. Let me come back, and I'm stopping the share for the moment just because I can see myself better. There's my daughter's half of a monkey puppet. <laughs> Fun. Okay, I can see myself better, which means I can see my calculator better. And so what you want to do 
is you want to take this whole list right here, restaurant A, B, and C, and you want to put them into one list on your calculator. So I'm going to do that now. You follow along. Don't just watch me type into my calculator. You can call. Don't forget to clear. Oops. It's hard to see this one because it's not lit in the back. Clear everything. I'm just going to go clear all because I haven't used my calculator in a while. And I'm going to type in everything into one list. 930, 750, 765, 870. See how it's all in that one list? I'm going to keep going. 875. 425, 525, 910, 675, keep going, 1100, 0, 0, 835, 690, 530, all in the same list. It's hard to see. Um, there's nothing else in those other lists, all in the same list. <clears throat> and the reason we do this is because you saw how tedious all this writing was. We don't want to write that out every single time. <coughs> so once you have it in your list, and you guys over here, you know what you're doing. Type in your list. You know how to type in the list. We are going to hit our favorite button, which is stat. We are now, because we have one single list, we are calling this one variable statistics. Same button we always push. The data is in L1. The frequency is one. We've been here before. Enter, enter, enter. Okay, same list that we've always seen. We haven't used everything on this list. We've used a lot. We've used the mean. We've used the standard deviation. We've talked about A's and B's and R's and all that good stuff. We've talked about sigma. We've talked about uh, all the quartiles and the medians, all that stuff. But what we've skimmed right past, oh, dagnabbit. Of course, I just hit that button right in the middle. Do, do, do. What we have skimmed right past is these important buttons, number five, six, yeah, five and six. Those are the ones we want. <clears throat> okay, do you see those symbols? Yeah, look on your screen. Mine's hard to see because it's reflecting of my computer. Um, five and six has the sum of the x's and the sum of the x squareds. So notice the sum of the x squareds is that purple number right there. I, uh, purple, it's underlined purple. That number right there is the sum of the x squareds. Brilliant. That is exactly the number that I wanted. So you don't have to write all this out. You don't have to write all of this notation. You can just ask your calculator, what's the sum of the x squared? And it will tell you this number right here. Love it. All right, so what do we do with the other number? Well, this is very important. I should have mentioned it before. Make sure you're out of your list. Make sure you are at a blank screen. And we are going to do that second fraction or the fraction part um, that you see on the notes. So blank screen, go back to that, oh, get out of the list, go to stat, one variable stats, enter, 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 scroll down to what number is the sum of the x's, scroll down to number five, and when I hit enter, I wish I knew how to, oh, I don't know, with my cell phone, I'm going to make some sort of shadow, I don't know, um, okay, hit enter, and I have the sum of the x's here. Now, pause a minute. I want the sum of the x's on the numerator of a fraction. What do I hit? N over d. Voila, my sum of the x's is now in the numerator. Now, I want to go back up. I want to put parentheses around it. Use the insert button. If you just type the parentheses button, you're going to get rid of your sum of the x. So get my parentheses, my square, and my n. Okay, so this is what, I have an idea. Do you think my cell phone has a flashlight? Ooh, yes, I mean, it does have a flashlight, but will that help? Oh, a little bit. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay, sum of the x squared with the parentheses around it over n, which is 13. This is brilliant. 
hit enter, actually hit enter, and voila, this number in orange, underlined in orange, is that number in the calculator. It did it for us. It added up all those X's for us. So we don't even have to worry about writing out that whole list of numbers. Look how long this list was. That whole list of numbers, adding them all up, squaring it, then dividing by 13. We just had to type it one time in the calculator. All right, what do you do over here? The same thing. You know how to type in L1. You know how to use those one variable stats under the calculation menu. And um, you have the option of your X. This one's easier to see. This is a different list, so ignore that the numbers are different. But you know how to get this list right here. It has the sum of the X, the sum of the X squared. And um, I don't know how to just magically make that number appear. But if the worst thing that happens is you have to type in that number, it was like 900 something. Um, let's see what it was. I miss, I miss everyone like just shouting out the answer while I'm sitting here fumbling with my calculator because you guys always tell me what the answer is, what number I'm thinking of. Um, okay, 900, 800, 9,880. So on this calculator, if that's all you have to do is put in 9,880, square it and divide by two. Remember your parentheses. Remember your parentheses. Um, I know you're sitting at home yelling at me. Divide by 13. Thank you. I hear you. Divide by 13. Okay. Voila. There we go. You get the number. You get the same number. So you might have to do an extra step, but hey, you have a graphing calculator, so you can do all kinds of extra stuff. Okay. So let me go back here. And here we are. So now we just talked about how to use your calculator to get this number that I made purple and this number that I made orange. And the last thing you have to do in this problem, uh, or not in this problem, but in this first step, is to subtract those two numbers. Yes, you have to type that into your calculator, but it's not that big of a deal um, to do that subtraction. Subtract with those two numbers and get 430,550. Okay, so that is, what we just found out the SS total. So I'm gonna go to the chart and we just did something and I'm very excited. So I'm going to write down 4,000, no, 430,550. Brilliant. Okay, we have done one hard thing. We are now going to do the second hard thing. But now that you see what the hard thing is, you're like, oh, we totally got this. And so we are gonna do the SS between, that's this box right here. So the formula for SS between is we're gonna add up the sums squared divided by the little ends. Okay, so this is what these little, this little J notation means. The, 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 um, the total was everything all together. The between is what's happening in each individual row. So let's go up here. We said what, we're using this later. We are now at this portion of it. Um, so n is 13 overall, but we have little n's here too. What is the n of restaurant A? There are four people or four sandwiches in that list. What is the n of restaurant B? There are five sandwiches in that list. What is the n of restaurant C? There are four sandwiches in that list. And so that's what is happening here. We said there's four sandwiches in the list that adds up to 3,315. I'm, I'm using these two numbers right here. So this all has to do with restaurant A, this has to do with restaurant B, and this has to do with restaurant C. How much sodium, add up that, call, add up that row and tell me how many numbers there are. Add up that row, I'm saying row, I mean column. Add up that column, tell me how many numbers are in that column. Add up that column, tell me how many numbers there are in that column. And we have a new purple number. And I wrote round up right here. Really, like the decimal part is so insignificant in these problems that you can be very liberal with your rounding. Look how many digits I have. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven digits. So whatever number comes after that, I don't need that much information. I already have too much. So I'm just rounding it to whole numbers because I like whole numbers. All right. The second one, it says to add up all the SJs, add up all those little sums, and then divide by the original sum. And you're starting to say, wait just a second. Even though the notation is a little different, I'm still adding up the columns, which is all the total numbers, and dividing by 13. Then, and this is not a coincidence. This number and this number are the same number because we're doing the same thing. We are adding up everything in all the columns and we are dividing by 13. So we, what, what, what was originally four different parts, right? Like one, two, three, four different parts is now three different parts because this guy and this guy are actually the same. So yes, this is hard as in time consuming. However, if you just take a breath, take a calculator, um, it, it, uh, you will get there. All right, so first number, second number, subtract them in your calculator, and this is what we get, 52,633, and that was our SS between. 52,633. Okay, so now that we've done the two really hard ones, Hopefully you have um, these printed out um, and can see this, or maybe you have it, this pulled up on your phone or you know on some other device. Hopefully you can see this table because we're gonna be using the formulas in this table to do everything else. We just found one and two, and now we're gonna do everything else. So for the SS within, I'm just gonna take this number and this number and subtract them. All right, so going back to our table that we've been working on right here, the SS within, and I'll just write it right here because there's room and why not? SS within, that formula from that chart, in case you can't see it, is the SS total minus the SS between. Sounds like we're on a ship right now, huh? Um, the SS minnow, uh -huh. just kidding. All right, 400. 30,550 minus 52,633. Dump that into your calculator. What do you get? 377,917. All right, almost done. Now, there's extra boxes here. You saw that on um, the formula table. These guys, yeah, we don't even need to do it. So look at that, we only have five boxes left. And so the degrees of freedom, remember for the numerator, this is the top right here, is the numerator, and that bottom one is the denominator. So degrees of freedom for the numerator, k minus one, degrees of freedom for the denominator, n minus k, Remember from the page above, and K was three, because there's three categories, N was 13, because there's 13 sandwiches. So K minus one is two, N minus K um, is 10, 13 minus three is 10. And now what we're gonna do is divide, divide, divide. So going along the top row, the mean square, is 52,633 divided by two. Just divide this divided by that, and that equals approximately, I'll just leave some squiggles. It's, a, it's gonna be a, a half because it's an odd number. So we're just gonna say 26317. We don't need decimals, just round. We will get to the, de the decimals will only matter on F. Okay, so now we have our numerator. For our denominator, we are going to divide three, seven, seven, nine, one, seven, divided by 10. Of course, we're gonna get a decimal again, that 0.7. Just round up to three, seven, seven, nine, two. 
Perfect. Last but not least, we have our numerator. The 26317, that is our numerator. We have a denominator. The, oops, I wanted to do that in green. The 37792 is our denominator. And what do we get? Now this one, I don't want to round to one. That well, makes any sense. I, I only have one number. I always want to have a couple of digits hanging around. So 696, that sounds like a couple of digits. So that's the perfect place to round to. <sighs> so the table is clearly the longest, most time consuming, hardest part of this problem. Uh, after this, we now have our test statistic and our critical value. We would use those two numbers to conclude whether we reject or fail to reject, and that's it. So we are going to move on to step six, which is to make a decision for the hypothesis test and re interpret the results. So again, I said this earlier, but it bears repeating. Reject region, fail to reject region. In other words, this is right tailed. Oh my goodness, look, at, I said it right there. Oh, I just said it a hundred times, who cares? You'll remember it the more I say it. It's a right tailed test. All right, so let's look at a different problem. We're just gonna practice um, different parts. In fact, we're actually gonna do a whole problem. However, um, I, yeah, you'll see. Okay, so this is a problem. Example five is a whole problem. We're gonna do this from start to finish. And it says a company wants you to compare the average, that's our mean, hospital stay for the three hospitals. Okay, so let's stop right there. Our null hypothesis is going to be the mean of the three hospitals. Notice I just used A, B, and C because those are the hospitals labeled. And then the alternative be that at least one is different, at least one mean is different. All right, so looking at this, um, we want to do, it says an ANOVA test is, is conducted, and we want to determine if the null hypothesis should be rejected at the 5% level. Okay, so what we would do next is calculate our test statistic and calculate our critical value. Those are the two things we're looking for. Test statistic is the one that's a pain, but I did all the hard stuff for you. So remembering that these four boxes are always blank, what we're gonna do is this last F, which is the division of our top number divided by our bottom number. So the final answer is always that fraction right there. All right. I'm going to get approximately three decimals, gives me three numbers. That's exactly what I want. And I have, um, I need to know, or I don't even need to know N and K in this problem because they already gave us the degrees of freedom. And so what I'm gonna look at my table for, so this, let me label this. This is the test statistic. Statistic is always, we calculate. And now I'm going to find the critical value, which is always from the table. And for here, remember, we just want the two degrees of freedom. I actually don't need to know what N and K is, although you could just look at this chart right here and you could see um, that K is three, and then you could count one, two, three, four, five, that N is 14. We could calculate it, but we don't need it because look, it's already done for us. So we want to find f of 211, 211. Those are the two numbers we're looking for. So in order to calculate that, or no, not calculate, in order to find this answer, I'm going to the last, oh, look, we're right to the last page. Um, two, already have a two, and then 11 right here, 3.98. So I'm using the degrees of freedom chart, uh, numerator and denominator, to calculate, to uh, find the critical value 3.98. All right, so we're ready to draw a picture. See how fast it is when I did all the work before ahead of time? 
Okay, so here is our picture. We have a right tail test. That is a horrible normal distribution, but as you can tell from hearing me, I'm getting more tired by the minute. So this right here is 3.98. That is always from the table. Our particular uh, test statistic is way over here at 0 0.534. So this is going to be a fail to reject. That is our, that's what we're going to conclude. So uh, we conclude, so there is not sufficient evidence or not enough evidence, whatever you want to say, to conclude or to support the claim. Let me, let me try to be as consistent as I can to support the claim that at least one mean is different. Same as everything. Claim is the alternative is not is because we failed to reject my goal is like that in your sleep you're just like is not means fail to reject i need to write the alternative as my claim just say it over and over again because that's why i'm saying it over again you just over and over again this is the same as same skeleton outline as chapter 9 and chapter 11 all of these tests are the same basic outline it's the details that are different okay uh, look at us. We just did a whole problem. Extra practice for those of you that are like, okay, that was great that you had the table done for me, but how do I do that table? For those of you that want extra practice, do it at, at home. Ha, get it? Do it at home because like you're literally doing everything at home. But seriously, do all the steps for an ANOVA table. You have all the answers right here. Look at, I'll even make it all pretty again. We have all of these answers for you. So just try to do it yourself. Try to calculate the degrees of freedom. Try to calculate the sum of squares between and total and then subtract them to get the within. Um, and then that will just give you extra practice. Everyone's always like, oh, I want a review, which we will have a review. But look at this is even more to review for the test. So keep that in mind if you're looking for something extra to do. All right, last problem, just a table. We have this table right here. We're just coming to the conclusion of um, practicing. Should we re should should the null be rejected or do we fail to reject? Okay, so we have our our um, our test statistic. We want to find our critical value. F of two seven. They gave us the two and the seven. So I go to this table. Two. There's only so many numbers, so you're going to see a lot of these numbers pop up all over again. So we've had two for like every problem. Two, seven, four point seven four. So let me just draw a quick sketch of what that would look like. Four point seven four is here. Where is our our um, test statistic? And what does that mean? There we go. We are going to fail to reject. All right. Thanks for hanging out with me. It's kind of, I don't know if it was long or not. I have no concept of time when I start recording, but I know it gets a little tedious there in the middle. But the good news is, is we have officially learned everything, like literally everything in this whole class. We've actually learned everything. Um, however, I will be uh, throwing up a few more videos um, of just more practice on this because clearly we, we didn't do enough practice. We just did one. We did it once. So we are going to do some worksheets with some more practice and um, yeah, and then we're going to have a review and that's it. But like literally that's it. This is the last new topic and we just finished it. So that has got to feel good, um, especially for those of you that are like working ahead. Woohoo. Um, all right, so I am going to go eat tacos right now and look forward to making some more videos in the future with uh, some worksheets for the same topic. All right, see you then.